This is the World Report of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, October 2023. Coming up, from small gifts to change lives, the church's giving machines impact people around the world. More temples in less time. The Helena Montana Temple is built piece by piece and assembled on site. But first, in the face of tragedy, Latter-day Saints join friends and neighbors to bring comfort, service, and hope in Hawaii. I would hope that everyone, church members and those who aren't members of our faith, that they feel hope. In the aftermath of the devastating Maui wildfires in August, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Hawaii jumped into action to help their neighbors in need, some of whom had lost their own homes. Unaloto Takiaho and his family evacuated their home, and the next day, it was destroyed by the fires. A lot of people asking if we're moving. I said, no, we're gonna stay and help each other. And that's what the gospel is all about. I know that through all these trials will help us to be stronger than ever. Members on the neighboring islands prepared boxes of food, clothing, and other supplies to help those in Maui. I saw a little note was on one of the box. It says, Maui, we love you, your ohana. Ohana in Hawaiian means your family. Church buildings in Lahaina opened as shelters where evacuees could have private rooms and supplies and connect with community resources. This is probably the best shelter I have seen. It provides individuality, it provides privacy, but this is what faith and this is what love is all about. The church donated an additional $1 million to the American Red Cross to help with relief efforts in the area. It was remarkable in a very sad way. In a region where more than 50,000 lives were lost and cities reduced to rubble by two powerful earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, the Church of Jesus Christ is helping to rebuild people's lives. $35 million is being donated by the church. Relief efforts include procuring and distributing medical supplies and providing clothing and bedding. Five mobile hospitals donated by the church are caring for patients in some of Turkey's hardest hit communities. The church is also working with the Turkish Disaster and Emergency Management Agency to provide hundreds of thousands of food and hygiene boxes to people in need. One of the four divinely appointed responsibilities that we have as a church, as a people, is caring for those in need. And it's not caring for those in need who have the same beliefs that I have. It's caring for those in need, whoever and wherever they may be. The church's efforts are also helping small business owners get back on their feet and providing a new camp with 500 container homes for displaced families. In South Sudan, health experts are closely monitoring Niatapo's young family. According to aid workers, her family is one of millions facing severe food insecurity in the region. This year, the Church of Jesus Christ made a $44 million contribution to multiple organizations, supporting hunger relief efforts and maternal and newborn care geared toward mothers and their children in more than 30 countries. Those first 2,000 days of life are absolutely critical to brain development. And if a child is well-nourished during that time, they stand the chance to flourish. Every Christmas season, donations made at the church's giving machines make their way around the world to help people in need through various charitable organizations from Africa to Mexico. On the Yucatan Peninsula is the little town of Seye. Here, these women's hands weave in and out, forming an intricate design that will unfold to reveal a hammock. They're learning a new skill that can be done at home without taking time away from their families. The women are neighbors, and together with funding from the Giving Machines through Mentors International, they formed a small co-op. The extra income helps them buy groceries and covers other household expenses. In Ukraine, volunteers are providing meals for refugees. 
They're assembling food boxes that started off as items offered at a giving machine. And there's also a shelter. The converted space provides refuge to mothers and their children. The efforts are coordinated through Lifting Hands International. They team up with local nonprofits to provide this critical service. We realize that one-time distributions of aid are a short-term solution. So we use that as, as a means to help people with their immediate needs. And then once we build that relationship, we can work on helping them with their longer term needs. In Western Tanzania, near Kasulu, a group of mothers is celebrating. They each started with three baby chicks that have grown to become 7,000 chickens in just three years. The women take their chickens and eggs to market to better care for their families. The mothers are leading the project with support from Church World Service. The funding comes from thousands of people who purchased chicken at the giving machines. A similar effort is underway nearby. Salman Shabani has raised 30 pigs from just two piglets in the same amount of time. She sells the pigs and uses the income to grow her farm and hire her neighbors. Salman, who was once shunned because she's unable to have children, has found a place with the other women of her community. It's not just about the two piglets that we gave her, but it's about her dignity in the society. It's about her being a person in these communities. In Kenya's Tana River Delta region, three communities of shepherds, farmers, and hunter-gatherers, once at odds with each other over scarce resources, are finding how to peacefully coexist through beekeeping. With beehives purchased at the giving machines, Church World Service is teaching them how to increase their honey production and prepare for market. The bees and their honey hold the promise of a sweeter future. I'm looking like a modern woman because of this product. We have the best honey in the world. The giving machines offer a variety of items and services from multiple charitable organizations. Functioning much like a vending machine, the idea is to make gift giving a personal experience. 100% of every item purchased goes directly to a nonprofit so they can distribute it to communities in need. The Church of Jesus Christ sponsors the giving machines and covers the overhead costs. This year, for the first time, the giving machines will be available in more than 50 cities and online at givingmachine.org. It has enabled me to grow better than what I was. And because of your help, because of your donations, now that now this is where I have reached. In San Francisco, more than 100 volunteers from the church showed up to help the nonprofit organization Life Moves clean and prepare a 240 bed facility called the Navigation Center for people experiencing homelessness. It's called the Navigation Center because we help navigate our clients onto their next and better place. This is not just an easy volunteer effort. The members, no matter what they're doing, they always have a smile on their face. The clients that we serve are why we exist. Latter-day Saints and folks who support our work is how we exist. Last year, more than 2,100 people returned to stable housing through Life Moves, and plans are in place to build several more navigation centers throughout California. When we come back, a lifelong dream comes true. A new pilot program brings voices from around the world to sing with the Tabernacle Choir. I still can't believe that I'm going to sing with the choir. There are remarkable blessings that have come because of this work in the lives of individuals and to the church itself. On the 179th anniversary of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, the Church Historian's Press released the final print volume in its landmark 27-volume work, The Joseph Smith Papers, which got underway in 2001. It's not novel style, it's not a narration, it's document after document after document, and you kind of put the narration together but you get a sense for how God uses an ordinary person and creates something magnificent. The project brings together Joseph Smith's surviving papers, including the foundational documents of the church, into an easily accessible collection. The comprehensive collection 
includes over 1,300 journal entries, over 600 letters, and over 150 revelations. In addition to the printed volumes, the project makes all its resources available for free on its website, josephsmithpapers.org. Music is a universal language, and using the power of music to bring the hope of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ has been the charge of the Tabernacle Choir since its founding in 1847. The entire church celebrates Christ. We not only speak His words, but we sing His praises. But for many members around the world, the dream of singing with the choir while living outside of Utah has been out of reach. We know it's impossible for us who do not live there. Until recently. As part of a new pilot program this past spring, the choir held auditions that would bring international participants to Salt Lake City to perform with the choir in the April 2023 General Conference. When I got an email, I thought it was a scam, you know, uh, because I don't live in Salt Lake. Participants were selected from Brazil, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Ghana, and Nigeria and an unexpected surprise for two women living on opposite sides of Mexico. They told me that I was chosen and one person more from Mexico. Her name was uh, Georgina Montemayor from Monterrey. I was like, what? <laughs> it's my sister-in-law. Neither of whom knew the other was auditioning. <laughs> I still can't believe that I'm going to sing with the choir. Throughout this conference, the Tabernacle Choir will be joined by global participants. É um dia memorável, um dia maravilhoso poder estar aqui cantar com o coro do Tabernáculo. At the close of the conference, the choir sang a tender farewell to their musical brothers and sisters from around the world. Hay una unidad entre todos los miembros y fuimos recibidos de una manera muy calurosa y podamos testificar, verdad, de nuestro Salvador mediante la música. More than half the membership, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, lives outside the United States. This is a means by which we not only reflect that membership, but it's also a way in which we can bring a sense of belonging. The global outreach of the choir continued in the summer when they kicked off their Worldwide Hope Tour with a six-day visit to Mexico City. This tour marks a new approach for the choir under its expanded mission to reach people throughout the world. In addition to performing live concerts, the choir engaged with humanitarian outreach, interfaith collaborations, and cultural connections. El Coro del Tabernáculo. And for the first time in its 100-year history, in late July, the Tabernacle Choir's flagship broadcast, Music and the Spoken Word, aired in Spanish. The weekly Spanish broadcast is another of the choir's pilot programs to increase its influence and worldwide visibility. When we return, honor for his contribution to peace and unity, President Nelson receives the Gandhi King Mandela Peace Prize. You have worked tirelessly to build bridges of understanding rather than walls of segregation. In ongoing recognition of Church President Russell M. Nelson's ministry as a global voice for peace, harmony, and reconciliation, he was recognized with the Gandhi King Mandela Peace Prize at historic Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, on April 13, 2023. Because you, Russell Marion Nelson Sr., carry the light of truth. The world leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was presented with the award in a pre-recorded video played at the ceremony, attended by an overflow audience of more than 2,600 people. 
It must begin with each of us. President Nelson truly walks the walk. One of the first things he reminded us that we need to root out racism. We need to rise above the polarization of this world. And most recently, he's called on us all to become peacemakers. God calls it to be so that President Russell Nelson would be the champion today for social justice, racial reckoning and reconciliation. You have worked tirelessly to build bridges of understanding rather than create walls of segregation. Well, we're bringing folks together at events like this. So to convene here this evening to celebrate those who have made outstanding contributions to interfaith harmony, to peace, and to justice, it's a powerful thing. You're going to receive a medallion, and the medallion will have on it the, the image, the profile of Gandhi, King, and Mandela. An oil portrait of President Nelson was also inducted into the school's International Hall of Honor, an honor given to dozens of other notable individuals over the chapel's storied history. God does not love one race more than another. Differences in nationality, color, and culture do not change the fact that we are truly sons and daughters of God. There's something very wholesome and very pleasant about President Nelson, you get the impression you're dealing with the real deal. <laughs> I have been blown away by what I have seen in Utah. In early April, a Ghanaian king, the Gamanse, traveled from West Africa to the Rocky Mountains of the United States and to the headquarters of the church. During his visit, the Gamanse saw the church's humanitarian sites, including Welfare Square and the Humanitarian Center. One of the highlights was an opportunity to attend the church's general conference. We welcome his Majesty King Mon Ga Mon Ke of Accra, Ghana, who is here with us today. While in Utah, the King met with senior church leaders, including the First Presidency. His Majesty also traveled to Brigham Young University in Provo, where he met with students from Ghana. I think that you are a great people. God bless this relationship. For the first time, a president of the General Assembly of the United Nations met with the first presidency of the church in Salt Lake City. A native of Hungary, Chaba Kurisi also visited the Family Search Library and Temple Square. The church works closely with various UN relief agencies, making substantial contributions through its humanitarian efforts. I really love President Oak's talk. It was really good, really helpful. And it really is about loving God and loving his children. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency, joined by his wife Kristen, held a devotional for young adults in May, where they shared numerous spiritual and life insights. These are stressful times for all of us, but the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us ample reason to be of good cheer. Your peers are afflicted by anxiety, vulnerable to drugs, addicted to social media, and seeking counseling in record numbers. You are affected by these influences, but for you, the good news outweighs all of that. You know you are children of God. In the lush green hills of Ohio and in the shadows of the historic Kirtland Temple sits a modest house that, like the temple, has significant meaning to Latter-day Saints. In this home, Joseph received revelations that continue to guide and strengthen the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the present day. In late August, after several years of careful research and restoration, town dignitaries, neighbors, and members of the Community of Christ and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints all witnessed the dedication of the Joseph and Emma Smith home in Kirtland, Ohio. This house was the place where they lived together for the longest period of time before Joseph's death. 
He oversaw the printing of the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants and the printing of the second edition of the Book of Mormon. Here he also organized the first High Council of the Church and translated a portion of the Book of Abraham. Prior to the dedication, the Bednars visited the Smith home as well as the Kirtland Temple with Community of Christ Apostle Lachlan E. McKay. The thing that has stood out the most to me today is the totality of being in the home of Joseph and Emma and being in the Kirtland Temple and thinking of how what they did influences all of us every day of our lives. This is an unusually yeah. unique and special visit for us. Das Vidanya. It was an inspiring, emotional, and spirit-filled journey as Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and his wife Melanie embarked on a European ministry in the spring that included visits to France, Germany, Armenia, and South Africa. I pray, Heavenly Father, we'll bless you. Everyone, of everything you need individually, one by one, in France, Elder Rasband met with journalist and Mayor Richard Delapierre to talk about the Book of Mormon and the positive impact the Paris-France Temple has had in the region. Okay, let's go to work. In Germany, Elder and Sister Rasband worked alongside missionaries to create hygiene kits to help victims of the February earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. In Armenia, the Rasbans visited missionaries and members like the Pogoshan family, who lost their son, Uvanes, in 2020. And the ceilings that your family made in the temple link your family together forever. Concluding his ministry, Elder Rasband met with the deputy president of South Africa and reflected on ways the church has helped relieve human suffering in that country. Por eso estoy aquí. En, en Chile, voy a Uruguay, Argentina, para predicar la palabra de Jesucristo. On a 10-day journey to three countries, Elder Ulysses Suarez with his wife, Hosena, shared the love of Jesus Christ with thousands of people in South America. At his first stop in Chile, Elder Suarez was invited to speak on a Chilean TV network, TVN, which is broadcast to 25 countries. Un apóstol es un hombre llamado por Dios por medio de inspiración al profeta de Dios que, que está en la tierra para representar a Jesucristo, para testificar de él. In Uruguay, Elder Suarez met with Uruguay President Luis Lacalle Po at his residence in Montevideo. It was a wonderful meeting, and we talked about his initiatives, his programs, his desire to uh, help the people of his country. The South American ministry concluded in Argentina, where he ministered to church members, spoke at an interfaith conference, and was interviewed by a prominent Argentine journalist. But we are all children of Heavenly Father, and that vision helps us to connect with people, helps us to feel close to them, and I hope they feel close to us. Coming up, the first of its kind temple in Thailand brings the spirit of the Lord to Bangkok and forever changes the life of one man who helped build it. And more than 700 church youth bring helping hands to the Special Olympics in Berlin. Bangkok, Thailand, a fertile land of rich spiritual history, landscaped with famed temples. And now, a new worship center is opening, a majestic temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Towering nearly 250 feet, this house of the Lord opened its doors for free public tours in early September. It's a beautiful building in a remarkably beautiful city, but it's much more than just a building. Construction of the Bangkok Thailand Temple began in January of 2019. Honorat Kauchau was hired as the construction manager. I didn't know anything about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Sin, but from the beginning, in my heart, I know the temple is the holy place. So it means a big responsibility on my shoulder. 
The temple has nine spires, each with decorative screens, which blend seamlessly with the heavens above, providing a silhouetted glowing ember at night. The interior design follows patterns and colors in Thai architecture. This is a place where heaven and earth connect. It allows us to tie to our ancestors, our families, to make families forever families. Four years after the construction, I want to know what I built. I used almost three months to learn the gospel. I realized that this is the thing that I'm looking for. Every Sunday when I attend the church, I feel love. Not only love from the God, also love from among the members. I say with my full heart that I am really happy that I become the member because now I feel more peaceful in my life. This temple means everything for me. Temple is also my baby. We're grateful that there's a house of the Lord here in Bangkok, Thailand. It's a temple not only for Bangkok, but for Southeast Asia and the world. We hope that wonderful people will come and feel the love of the Lord, that they'll find peace, sanctity, family, protection, they'll find joy. The temple will be dedicated on October 22, 2023. We reclaim this land and honor the countless lives lost and enslaved. An historic occasion on what's considered hallowed ground. Welcome to the grand opening dedication ceremony and celebration of the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. The museum, out of respect, is elevated on pillars above the very ground where slave ships brought 40% of all enslaved Africans into the United States. Clearly this space holds stories of trauma and tragedy, but it also holds stories of resilience. It's a powerful museum, one that every American can learn something from. It features a center for family history, which can be used as a resource to trace your own genealogy. The museum's Center for Family History is supported by the church's Family Search International and was made possible by a $2 million donation from the church. One of the things I've really appreciated about the relationship with the church is that the Center for Family History has become the not-so-hidden gem of the museum. It's a powerful part of the museum experience, and I think the church um, making that gift uh, was really just transformational in helping this happen. Family Search International has given support and free access to billions of records to the Center for Family History and those hoping to discover their heritage and homeland. This is a sacred space. There was a vision of what they wanted to accomplish, and church leaders saw the vision, and now that vision is a reality, and that vision is going to inspire millions of people. The International African American Museum, I Am, is now open, a noble undertaking of truth and hope that promises to pay huge dividends beyond any monetary worth. We are their legacy, and they are why we must continue to fight for truth and hope. It was a scene of hope and inspiration in Berlin. In June, more than 6,000 athletes from 190 countries came to compete in the 2023 Special Olympics. And behind the scenes, 700 young adult members and friends of the church who volunteered as part of a Europe-wide service conference. We have the church group, which is around 700 people, and they are helpful because they are very trustful and can help and can take a big part of that volunteering experience. Especially the game, volleyball, is inspiring me to work as a team together. And it's the same thing with this huge conference. We all work together hand in hand. And it's amazing to see how we all work together in unity to make this big thing happen. For the two-week event, conference participants came from 48 countries to show their love for God by helping others and to foster a sense of unity and belonging. The world will recognize that we have a wonderful youth. We have true disciples of Jesus Christ. It is a special, large group open to the world.
there's a place in the church educational system for you. More students than ever before are receiving a college education through the church educational system with enrollment at its universities and colleges at nearly 150,000 this year. While efforts to serve even more students are expanding online, BYU Pathway now offers a bachelor's degree to students. There is tremendous momentum in the church educational system. We see deeper engagement, higher relevance, and a real focus of students coming out of the pandemic. BYU is the flagship ambassador. BYU-Idaho's enrollment has more than tripled. BYU-Hawaii has really been asked to focus on its target area. BYU Pathway just continues to grow unabated. The church's universities and colleges are committed to offering students a quality education while strengthening their faith in Jesus Christ. There really are four core messages to parents and youth in the church. The first is education is a spiritual responsibility. The second is to involve the Lord in your learning. The third is to have confidence that BYU's spiritual leadership across the entire church educational system is strong and growing. And the fourth is BYU-Idaho is an incredible option. We believe in the student. We believe in the potential of the students that come here. We've tried to create a place here that they can become lifelong disciples of Christ and then go out into the world to make the world a better place. Everything we do at the university starts and ends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That includes the hope that accompanies the gospel of Jesus Christ, kindness that comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I haven't smiled this much in a long time. Very happy it went this well. Coming up, the Salt Lake Temple renovation reaches a critical milestone, and we'll take you to the dedications and groundbreakings of temples around the world when we come back. Jesus Christ is the reason we build temples. As the work of temple building continues throughout the world, several newly completed and renovated temples have been dedicated. In the Eastern United States, President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency dedicated the Richmond, Virginia Temple on May 7th. Announced by President Nelson in 2018, this is the first temple in the state of Virginia. On June 4th, the Columbus, Ohio Temple was rededicated by Elder M. Russell Ballard following an extensive renovation. The Columbus, Ohio Temple was originally dedicated in 1999 by then President Gordon B. Hinckley. On June 18th, Apostle Gary E. Stevenson dedicated the Helena, Montana Temple. This is the second temple in the state of Montana and the first to be built with a new modular construction technique that allows for temples to be built faster than ever before. More about the construction of this temple will be coming later in this broadcast. Following a public open house, President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency dedicated the Saratoga Springs, Utah Temple on August 13th. The Saratoga Springs, Utah Temple is the 18th temple built in Utah. And for the first time in the history of the church, on September 17th, three separate temples were dedicated. In the United States, Apostle David A. Bednar dedicated the Bentonville, Arkansas Temple, making it the first temple in that state. In the Northwest United States, Apostle Quentin L. Cook dedicated the Moses Lake Washington Temple, which is the fourth temple in the state of Washington. And in South America, Apostle Neil L. Anderson dedicated the Brasilia Brazil Temple. Located in the northern section of the city, this will be the 10th temple dedicated in the country of Brazil. In addition to dedications, since April, ground has been broken for temples in Port Vila, Vanuatu, Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, Montpelier, Idaho, and Belo Horizonte, Brazil. As well as dedications and groundbreakings, the church's historic temples continue to be restored and renovated. At the temple renovation site in Salt Lake City, a major milestone was achieved in May, the successful installation of the first of 98 base isolators. This is literally the most critical, most difficult portion of the entire project that we're starting right now. 
Each base isolator is about seven feet in diameter and weighs 18,000 pounds. Once in place, the base isolators act like giant sliding bearings to keep the temple stable in an earthquake. We were meticulous in getting everything measured just right so that when we drop that into place, it's, it sits exactly where it's supposed to go. Pretty gratifying to get to this point, to see an isolator actually go in place. I haven't smiled this much in a long time. Very happy it went this well. The last three years of work has been in preparation for the base isolators. Reinforced concrete footings had to be constructed below the temple's pioneer built foundation, 35 feet from the original surface. The old stone foundation had to be reinforced and tensioned steel rods were added to further tie in and strengthen the old foundation. Eventually, everything that's been done to strengthen the foundation will be secured to the roof with similar tension cables from the top of the temple to its new foundation. If an earthquake happens, all who revere this sacred iconic structure will be grateful for the foresight and difficult work that has gone into the historic seismic upgrade. Being able to get to this point has been a huge accomplishment. This is what we've worked for. When we return, Salt Lake City hosts the largest YSA conference ever. The church's partnership with the NAACP helps educate new mothers in Memphis, and Family Search and the Smithsonian Folklife Festival help people connect to their past. These stories and more in the news. Sight. Relief Society General President Camille N. Johnson, along with her counselors, kicked off the annual BYU Women's Conference in May. This was the first time in two years the conference was held in person, again filling BYU's Marriott Center and the BYU campus. In mid-July, President Johnson also participated in a panel discussion on religious freedom at the Notre Dame Law School Summit in London. As faith groups come together, we can be light. President Johnson, who was formerly a practicing attorney, was on a panel with two other religious leaders for the event. In the spirit of stewardship and conservation of the Great Salt Lake, which was at historically low levels, in April, Bishop W. Christopher Waddell of the presiding bishopric outlined the church's donation of water shares equivalent to a water supply for 20,000 single-family homes. This permanent donation of water will benefit the Great Salt Lake and its vital place in the surrounding ecosystem and economy. Fostering new friendships while growing closer to Jesus Christ, thousands of young single adults attended the 2023 Utah Area Young Single Adult Conference in August. Spanning three weekends, the conference offered concerts, a 5K run, service, and spiritual nourishment from church leaders, including Elder D. Todd Christofferson. This you. year's theme, Together in Christ. There is a special spirit when we all have come together, both to have fun and to learn and to come into Christ. Everyone's like pumped up, they're like, yes, we're doing service. It's like so positive. Hundreds of teens from 50 high schools gathered at a church meeting house in Aliso Viejo, California in April to assemble 50,000 packets of instant oatmeal for people in need. There are hundreds of kids in there right now. We're all working to package as many meals as we physically can. I think we're at 20,000 already. The project was sponsored by Just Serve as part of Global Youth Service Day, an initiative sponsored by Youth Service America. <laughs> in an effort to combat infant mortality, Expectant mothers in Memphis, Tennessee are learning how to better care for their newborns in the church and NAACP supported My Baby For Me program. How he's supposed to sleep or how many times he's supposed to feed them, I pretty much learned all of that in class. The church is also investing $500,000 to renovate the Memphis office of the NAACP to create an invited gathering place for NAACP and community events. Latter-day Saints around the world can now receive church materials more quickly. In June, Bishop Gerald Cosse of the presiding bishopric dedicated a new state-of-the-art global distribution center in Salt Lake City. Shipping nearly 6,000 custom-made boxes daily, this distribution center will serve nearly 75% of the church's worldwide volume. 
reflecting a sensitivity to a rapidly changing world. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles have issued a second edition to the missionary teaching guide, Preach My Gospel. It's the first time in nearly two decades the Gospel Teaching Guidebook has been updated. In July, Family Search International had a major presence in Washington, D.C., as it took part in the Smithsonian's Folk Life Festival held on the National Mall for two weeks. History is too important just to be in the hands of historians. It ought to be in the hands of all of our families, and that's why I love Family Search. When we come back, holy ground in Big Sky Country. See how a revolutionary new building process brought a house of the Lord to Helena, Montana. We are adapting to the counsel of a prophet, so we have to do things a little bit differently to make sure that that can take place. It's beautiful and it's amazing and it is truly a house of God. In the capital city of the Big Sky Country, the newly completed Helena, Montana Temple is open to the public before its dedication in June. What you'll notice when you enter the temple is, is a simplistic beauty, but what you'll feel is, is a spirit of peace. Like other temples, its architecture is majestic, its finishes refined and beautiful. But the Helena, Montana Temple has a unique distinction too, as the first temple of its kind to use a revolutionary building process that promises more efficiency, less construction time, and a positive conservation impact. A new temple will be built in each of the following locations. Since becoming president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 2018, Russell M. Nelson has announced plans to build 133 new temples across the globe. We have a prophet who is just laser focused on the importance of temples and temple work. Bishop W. Christopher Waddell, first counselor in the church's presiding bishopric, is part of the leadership body charged with overseeing the prophet's temple building vision. We are adapting to the counsel of a prophet to provide temples for members of the church throughout the world. And so we have to do things a little bit differently to make sure that that can take place. Enter Blocks, a new technology, design, engineering, and construction company. Blocks is working with the church on a pilot program for select temples, a process referred to as DMI, short for Design, Manufacture, and Install. DMI is the process of manufacturing temple modules in an off-site facility, then shipping them to an announced temple site for installation. Change from um, a stick-built process where you recreate projects every single time, where you can really start to scale and leverage supply chain and other resources. In the Birmingham, Alabama plant, the first temple of this type was developed. The temple has 25 unique uh, modules that all piece together perfectly to align so that we can take this temple anywhere in the world. The completed modular components are shrink-wrapped and shipped to the temple site. It's a remarkable thing to see the hand of the Lord in all of this. Because of, of progress in technology and construction methods, it's now possible to do what is being done. And I came here. Uh, in two weeks and we have a structure. I feel like it's something that can change the, the way we build temples around the world. As a Latter-day Saint, logistics manager Zach Hart is grateful for the opportunity to be part of such a meaningful project. When I told my family what I was gonna do in my new job, it was, it was, a, it was a tearful moment that we'll be able to bring temples to many more people in a much faster time period than standard constructions. This is what it's all about for us. What we're really looking at is trying to bring temples more to the members of the church. In many cases, the DMI process will reduce the time to build a temple by more than half. I feel these things will bless the life of the people. A new process that preserves the long established quality and regal beauty found inside and out of sacred houses of the Lord, like the Helena Montana Temple. It's just going to be a continued blessing for members of the church around the world. This has been the World Report for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, October 2023. To watch The World Report online, visit newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org. 
And to watch full-length versions of these stories, subscribe to the Church Newsroom YouTube channel.